Welcome to this episode of Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge, where each week I offer 15 to 20 minute answers to tough theological and pastoral questions. This show is a 100% listener supported audio ministry of relearn.org. And for those who don't know, our mission at relearn.org is to bring the church back to the Bible. For bold daily encouragements, join the over 500,000 Christians who follow us on social media by searching for relearn.org on any platform. Well, it's my belief that in order to fully comprehend and appreciate the gospel, we must first grasp the state of man prior to receiving that gospel. Today's episode is unique and it'll be a little bit longer than our regular 15 to 20 minute shows. The questions I'm going to attempt to answer are how fallen was I before I was saved? And before I was a Christian, was I able to freely choose or reject Jesus Christ? But before we dive in, I just want to make one quick announcement. Are you struggling with the sin of pornography? I know so many people are. And we have created as a ministry uh, a course in which I filmed a simple gospel-centered program. It's a three-week program for breaking free from the bondage of pornography. And you can have, uh, you can finish the course in one sitting. You can also do it over a three-week period. It's very affordable. And we have just had so many testimonies from hundreds of people. And we've actually had uh, nearly 2,000 people go through the program and find freedom from the sin of pornography. And so if you are struggling with that and are ready to break free, uh, go to standinvictory.org. Again, that's standinvictory.org. Okay, so we're not answering a question from the audience today. We're answering a question that I have been studying uh, for several months, and uh, I'm going to uh, you know pose this question to the show today. And so basically it's this. According to the Bible, do fallen human beings have a free will? That is, can they, on their own, choose to accept or reject the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, let me begin by saying this is a massive topic. Uh, a 200 to 300 page book could make a dent in the discussion, but a you know 20 to 35 minute podcast can't. And that's actually the problem with doing episodes on topics like this. We're so flooded with the quantity of information that we never have the time or discipline to labor over the entire discussion and and gain the robust understanding of the issue that we really need. Uh, For example, I mean, the study of the human will is, it's kind of one of those issues that takes several weeks to even grasp the glossary of terms uh, required to have a deep and meaningful discussion about it. Uh, But in this episode, uh, I'm going to attempt to give you at least a snapshot of the conversation in hopes that it might spur you on to a further study and further gratitude for God's sovereignty over your life. And I'm going to share a few helpful resources at the end of this episode uh, to support further study on your own. Next, I want to just clarify that this discussion is specifically about the issue of human free will as it pertains to choosing to accept or reject the gospel. Uh, That's to say, uh, this is not an episode about the overall discussion regarding the interplay between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Uh, That's a much larger discussion. And for the record, just so you know, if you're a theologian and you understand some of these terms, um, you know, I am what theological circles have identified as a compatibilist, meaning that I believe that God's predetermination and meticulous sovereign providence is compatible. Um, It's compatible with voluntary choice of human beings. And this is, again, the standard Reformed position, and you can find uh, several helpful articles on that issue uh, at monergism.com. That's M-O-N-E-R-G-I-S-M, monergism.com. But again, that is not the focus of today. Uh, Today's episode is specifically focused on determining if fallen man can freely choose Christ. So let's let's just first start by uh, defining the term free will. Free will means that you have the ability to exercise self-determination. Uh, this isn't autonomy, which uh, means to have you know, absolute freedom. 
the only autonomous one is God. Um, no, we're talking about human will and attempting to determine if it's free to choose or reject Jesus Christ as Lord. Uh, more specifically, in regard to the acceptance of the gospel, um, people who believe that humans have, quote, free will, believe that they ultimately have the unobstructed ability to make the decisive action to accept or reject Jesus Christ. This is called uh, libertarian free will theology. And these folks are not compatibilists, and they are what's called incompatibilists, right? Meaning that they believe God's predetermination and meticulous providence is incompatible with voluntary choice of human beings. And this view is held by the Arminians and not the Calvinists. Now, guys, we're going to just imagine we're walking into a deep pool, okay? Because this is going to get deeper and deeper and deeper, but it's all going to wrap up at the end. So I know these terms might be going, whoa, they're going way over my head. Stay with me here. Stay with me. You will see what I'm talking about at the end. I know there's some terms that you're just not grasping, but just stay here. So on the other hand of what I just mentioned, um, people who reject free will, um, and that's me, meaning I, I'm rejecting free will, and we're going to actually define what that means in a minute. Um, you know, we believe that prior to Christ, uh, people's will was ens- enslaved to sin and corrupted to such a degree that in their fallen state, um, they did not have the unobstructed ability to make the decisive action to accept Jesus Christ. So, to be clear, both groups, okay, the compatibilists, the incompatibilists, the Arminians, and the Calvinists, right, both groups believe that fallen man outside of Christ has a will, okay, but one group believes fallen humans still had the capability to freely choose or reject Christ, these are the Arminians, and the other group believes the will is enslaved to sin and unable to choose Christ, these are the Calvinists. So you got a little bit of a landscape and a little background there. Now, the root of this discussion really lays at the fallenness of man, specifically how fallen is fallen man, right? Since Adam's sin uh, and the fall of mankind, of all mankind in Genesis chapter 3, are humans so morally corrupted that they cannot willfully choose anything that is truly good. Uh, again, which would include choosing to repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, first, we need to define good. What is good? Now, can a fallen man outside of Christ do a righteous deed? Can he stop looking at pornography? Can he um, feed the poor? Can he donate money to a local hospital in need? Yes, of course he can do these things. But are these righteous deeds, according to Scripture, good? So again, the central question is not what makes an action righteous according to the law, but what makes an action good according to God. Well, um, right out of the gate, we have to deal with what Romans 3.12 says. It says, in speaking to fallen man, quote, there is no one who does good, there is not even one, end quote. Um, So that's just, let's just lay that there on the floor for a second. R.C. Sproul offered an example in a video series called Chosen by God um, that I believe is actually really helpful. And um, I'll link it for you at the bottom of this, um, or at the end of this episode. Uh, And he says, and I'm paraphrasing, quote, We recall the story of Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers. When he was... uh, When he has this reunion with his family many years later, and they repent of that former sin, what does Joseph say to them? He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's Genesis 50, 20. He continues by saying, ultimately, we see an example of God making a choice in the matter. God has chosen at least to allow this tragedy to happen and befall Joseph. His brothers also made a choice about what to do with Joseph. Now, while the intention of his brother's choice was wicked, the intention of God's choice 
was altogether holy and good. So ultimately, what we learn here, and what we will see here in a few minutes, is that a choice is not simply deemed good by what we choose, but also by our intention in making that choice. So an action that may be called righteous as it pertains to the law can only be called good by examining the motivation behind that action. So again, uh, the question is, can fallen man outside of Christ do good or choose good? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 14, 23, that for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Now, now this doesn't tell us what's good, but it does tell us that any action that doesn't come from a place of faith in Christ is evil. It's sin. And that is that while fallen man can do righteous deeds, think about the Pharisees, right? If they are not done to the glory of God through faith in Jesus Christ, they are sinful. Okay, so did you catch that? I want you to catch this, okay? In order for a choice or action to be truly good, it must not only be a righteous act, but also be done from an intention to glorify God in Jesus Christ. That is key. Now, if we look at the husband, for example, um, who doesn't believe in Christ, but quits looking at pornography, is his motivation behind this decision to glorify God or to glorify self? That is, does he quit porn because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the desire to be obedient to his Lord who redeemed him? Or does he quit porn because uh, he sees that quitting or that by quitting, he'll cause less pain to his wife and experience less pain, sorrow, and guilt as a result. In other words, is his action motivated by the magnification of God's glory, or is it motivated by the preservation of his own comfort? Well, surely it's the latter. It's definitely the latter. Any righteous act that's not motivated by faith in Christ to the glory of God is sinful. It's self-righteousness if it's not done to the glory of God, and it's not good. I'll put it another way. Is it possible for a fallen person, someone who doesn't know Jesus, to perform a truly good deed without faith in Christ? Again, the Bible tells us unequivocally, no, fallen man cannot do good deeds. Fallen man cannot make choices from a place of faith in Christ to the glory of God. And we know this because the Bible tells us about the state of the heart and the will of man. I'm going to read several scriptures to you. Pay attention here, please. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Uh, Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, you got two passages that I just read about the heart. In Hebrew, uh, and in Hebrew culture, the heart is the seat of a person's will. So it's saying that the heart, the will of man, is deceitful, and it's desperately sick. Okay, just so you have that context there. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us, for all of us, have become like one who is unclean. And all our good deeds are like a filthy garment. All of our good deeds are like a filthy garment. In the New Testament, Jesus says in John 3, 19, the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 tells us, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Romans 3.10, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, 
the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And the last one, 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Okay, the answer, people, is no. Fallen man cannot make truly good decisions because he cannot even see what true goodness is. And this is why Jesus says in John 3, 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. Okay, you definitely can't get somewhere that you can't see. He can't even see it until he's born again. Ultimately, fallen man has a will, but he can only choose greater or lesser forms of evil with that will. He cannot do good or choose good in his current state because he's blind to true goodness in his current state. Okay, Dr. Bentner of Princeton Seminary in the early 1930s, he explained this when he said this, and I quote, Horses and cattle may see the same beautiful sunset and other phenomenon in nature that men see, but they are blind to all of the artistic beauty. So it is with the gospel of the cross is presented to the unregenerate man. He may have an intellectual knowledge of the facts and the doctrines of the Bible, but he lacks all spiritual discernment of their excellence and finds no delight in them, end quote. So in a sense, uh, fallen man has a, quote, free will, but it's not really free because it's limited only to sin. So Augustine once said, fallen man has free will, but he has not liberty. Okay, so to put it another way, fallen man has a free natural will. He can do things with his body, you know, without being forced or coerced, but he does not have a free moral will, meaning he cannot do things that approve himself to God. Uh, because the only way to do or to choose anything truly good is to do that thing from a place of faith in Jesus Christ alone. So ultimately, fallen man is stuck in a fallen paradigm. Okay, so I want you to grasp that. Fallen man is stuck in a fallen paradigm. Now, if you can imagine two giant circles side by side, the one on the left is the paradigm of fallen man, and the one on the right is the paradigm of redeemed man. Okay, every expression of the will that fallen man does is done within that fallen circle. And to say that just a little differently so you guys can maybe grasp this, everything he does is done in sin because he cannot glorify God, because he will not glorify God, because he hates God, because of the moral corruption of the fall. Okay, he is morally unable and spiritually sick. That's how fallen he is. He's infected and enslaved to sin. He's defiant toward God. He loves himself. He's blind to his need of repentance. He sees no value or beauty in Christ. So, if you want to call what he has free will, you can, but it's like calling a prisoner free while they're locked in a dungeon. Like, sure, they can do push-ups and use the toilet, but that's kind of a gross misuse of the word free. I think a better and more accurate term is to say that fallen man has free agency in a fallen state, but he does not have free will. And, um, you know, he, he does not have free will because he is not free to choose Christ. Uh, meaning that since the fall, and because of our moral and spiritual inability, every human being is 100% dependent upon God for salvation. I wanna, I'm just going to say that one more time. What's going on here is this. Since the fall, and because of our moral inability and spiritual inability, every human being is 100% dependent upon God for their salvation. Okay, so, so how does a fallen person who is in that paradigm and slave to sin 
a person who loves evil deeds, who is darkened in their conscience, who has a hardened heart of stone, who is blinded to the light of Christ by Satan, who is deaf to the truth, who is dead in their trespasses, and who is unable to discern spiritual things. How is this person able to come to a place of genuine repentance, the giving up of their self-glorifying life, and casting all of their hope and trust on Jesus Christ? How does that happen? Well, I'll tell you what, it's not because they just had the free will to decide to do so. Okay, It's not because some evangelist offered a highly persuasive presentation of the gospel and they were finally intellectually convinced that Jesus' way of life was better than their own. It's not because they were you know, tired of their sinful lifestyle and they were fed up with the guilt and the shame of their morality or immorality and they decided to make Jesus their God. Okay, that's not what happened. Something miraculous happened. Something moved them, moved you, from the fallen paradigm of actions that are done in sin to the glory of self, that's the circle on the left, to the redeemed paradigm of actions that are done in Christ to the glory of God, that's the circle on the right. Okay, the Bible teaches us that we need something. We're so fallen and we're so blind and we're so darkened and we're so lost and we're so dead. We need something to interject into our fallen paradigm and overcome the effects of our moral depravity and spiritual death. That's what the Bible teaches. And I think Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says it great. It says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. End quote. I also think that James 1.18 says it well. It says, Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. In other words, in order to go from the fallen paradigm of only sinful choices and spiritual death to the redeemed paradigm of enabled good choices and spiritual life, we need to be spiritually resurrected. That is that we need to be born again. Okay, we need what the Lord had said to uh, his chosen people in Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from the flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Okay, essentially, be because we cannot save ourselves, we're so blind, we're so fallen, we need Christ to save us. Okay, basically, in the same way that Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead, mind you, without his permission, we need Jesus to resurrect us from spiritual death. And again, he does this without our permission. This is a completely sovereign act. It's not something that we participate in. In fact, we have just as much involvement in our spiritual birth as we did with our physical birth, which is none. Okay, and this is why Jesus says in John 3, 7 through 8, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit, end quote. Jesus is saying, basically, just like you can't control the wind, or see where it's going or where it came from, you don't know who the Spirit will resurrect or who he will pass over. He comes and goes where he wishes, and humans have no way of controlling his life-giving work. Okay, Titus 3.5 says, He saved us, comma, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Okay, mercy requires inability on behalf of the receiving party, okay? By the washing, it, says, it continues on, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Okay, he does this, the Holy Spirit comes and he does this, not by violating our will, but by making us willing through regeneration. This is essentially the doctrine of irresistible grace. It's the I in Calvinism's tulip. 
Okay, through regeneration, he gives us a new heart that allows us to see and hear the truth. He gives us the gift of repentance and faith by which we are justified. And he frees us from the bondage of sin to the giving of the Holy Spirit. And this is why Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, um, 8, 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, the this is that this is the grace and the faith, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. The grace and the faith is the gift of God. Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith, not a result of works so that no one may boast. I'm going to read that one more time. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this, the grace and the faith, is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. So let me just kind of offer you a quick summary of what we've learned, and then I'll close with a brief explanation of the state of your will as a result of redemption, meaning the state of your will as a believer. So in a fallen state, you have a will, but it's not free. Uh, You're, and again, we're going with the definitions that I defined earlier. You're able to make choices, Without regeneration uh, by the Holy Spirit, you're unable to make those choices to the glory of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's this reason that you're blind and deaf to the gospel. And this is why Jesus often said, He who has eyes to see, let him see, and he who has ears to hear, let him hear, right? Therefore, the only way someone can go from a place of such spiritual darkness to spiritual light is because God issues an effectual call in the heart of his elect. Okay, he gives the sinner new spiritual life, a new heart, new eyes and ears to see their sin and enable them to repent and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. So, uh, what's really the conclusion of our discussion today, right? What's the conclusion? What are we talking about? What's the conclusion regarding man's free will? If freedom, okay, freedom, if freedom means that you are free to to only choose evil, then you can say that you have free will. However, again, I, along with Augustine, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John, Jonathan Edwards, Spurgeon, B.B. Warfield, John MacArthur, Sproul, and many others argue that fallen man does not have moral free will. That is, he cannot choose evil and good, and therefore He is not a free moral agent. So let me just close with kind of a brief zoomed out explanation of what we've been talking about that might just give you a little bit of an understanding of kind of the flow of the grand narrative of redemption. So if we zoom out on a timeline and we're looking at Adam and Eve and we're looking at the fall and we're looking at Jesus coming and we're looking at the restoration of, uh, you know, all mankind, um, sorry, the restoration of the new heavens, the new earth, and the glorification of the saints, okay? So he's looking at the whole timeline. Um, If we look at the beginning with Adam and Eve, they both had free moral will. That is, they had the ability to choose good and evil. After the fall of man, Adam and Eve and all subsequent people were not able to not sin, okay? That is, they lost their moral free will and were stuck in that fallen paradigm. All they could do is sin. So they lost their free moral will. Now, when a person is born again, that person returns back to a Garden of Eden-like state where we, again, have a free moral will to choose both good to the glory of God and faith of Jesus Christ, and evil. And the last part of the timeline is that when we're glorified in heaven with Christ, we will only be able to choose good morally. Okay, so Adam and Eve could choose both good and evil. Fallen man can only choose evil. Born again man can choose good and evil. And glorified man can only choose good. This is actually... uh, I think it's called the Augustinian or Augustan matrix. Um, It's actually, you can see this in R.C. Sproul's book, 
uh, chosen by God. He talks about this. It's on page 49, if you want to check that out. But it's, um, it's a really wonderful chart that shows the paradigm of the will over time and God's redemptive purposes. Now, people, I know this is a lot, and this is a big discussion, as I mentioned at the introduction of this show, but what should it do to your reverence for God and your appreciation of the gospel? Well, it should magnify them both. Okay, when we realize that the only reason we are spiritually alive in a saved state with a free moral will is because God sovereignly chose us before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians 1. He did not choose us based on any conditions known to us other than his love for us. And what makes this so special is the same reason it makes any wife feel special in marriage or any child feel special in adoption. What makes it so special is that he chose you and he didn't choose someone else. That is what makes it so special. He passed over someone else and chose you because he loved you. His love placed on you through election, saving you from your spiritual darkness and death, understanding the state of of your being prior to Christ and not contributing any of your salvation to yourself or to your own free will that you were wise enough to choose God because you weren't. When you remove all that and when you start to see that it's God who did it all, I was totally unable and actually loving my inability. I was following the course of this world, following the prince and the power of the air. I was fallen and loving my sin because I didn't like the light because I love darkness and my works were evil. When you realize that that was you, even if you were five years old when you were saved, when you realize what you've been saved from and the magnitude of what you've been saved from, you will appreciate your savior even more. And that's the purpose of this episode, to help you understand how lost you were and how beautiful it is that you've been made alive and found in Jesus Christ. So as always, guys, I'm going to leave you guys with a few resources that will offer further understanding on the topic that we've been discussing today. And you can find them on the post page for this episode, just at relearn.org. This is episode 131, and it's titled, Do People Have Free Will to Choose or Reject Christ. So uh, a couple things. I'm going to recommend a book. If you haven't read Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul, fantastic introduction. It's not even really about the will. It's more about the sovereignty of God. However, uh, it's a good uh, lay person, meaning it's a good uh, introduction. There's not a lot of heavy theological language. Um, It's a great book, and it's not that long either. So that's Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul. He does a course Uh, on this that you can watch on Ligonier's website. I'll link it. It's called What is Free Will by R.C. Sproul. It's like a five-video course you can watch for free. Um, Also, there's a book uh, that's very heavy, a couple books I'm going to give you that are very heavy. Uh, The first one is The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther. The second is The Freedom of the Will by Jonathan Edwards. And the third one is uh, The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination by Dr. Bentner. Um, and again, I'll link all those. If you read all of those books, I mean, wow. One, those are some of the highest thinking books on earth, but they are good to just set on your nightstand and get a couple days or a couple pages a night and just do some underlining, do some thinking, let it form um, your theology and how you're viewing scripture and uh, how you're viewing the gospel. So hopefully those resources are helpful. Um, if you guys have not left a review on the show, please do so. You don't need to write anything. You can just tap the stars in the podcast app. But if you do leave a review, I will read it. I think we're actually right about to pass 6,000 reviews. And those reviews really do help the exposure of our show. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, um, as well as following uh, me on Twitter. Yeah, I'm actually at Dale Partridge on Twitter. Um, and we would love to have you on social media. We're putting out regular content that will be edifying for your walk with Christ. 
On that note, thank you for joining me today. My name is Dale Partridge, and I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of Real Christianity. If you're a regular listener to this show, would you prayerfully consider making a donation to support our ministry efforts? Simply visit relearn.org forward slash donate. Again, that's relearn.org forward slash donate. And for those looking to explore the idea of joining or planting a church in your home, you can download our free PDF ebook titled The Basics of Biblical House Church by visiting relearn.org forward slash house. Lastly, do you have a theological question you would like answered on the show? Submit your question at relearn.org forward slash question. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Real Christianity. We will see you next Wednesday.